The Chevy Mystery Show. Starring your host, Mr. Walter Slezak. Presents The Game. Tonight's unusual drama, Thunder of Silence, by Adrian Speed. Brought to you by Chevrolet for economical transportation. Welcome back. In our story tonight, the main characters are not represented by the big pieces now, chessboard. The kings, the queens, the bishops, the knights. Tonight, the lowly pawns are all important. Small, helpless pawns. In this case, children. Not normal children, but children with an affliction. Children who live in the state institution, the Hawthorne School for the Deaf. Our story opens on a scene of panic and terror. Starring James Whitmore. Also starring John Hoyt, Alan Hewitt, Joe DeSantis, Sandy Kenyon, in Thunder of Silence. a noise, and when I came down, I saw it. You better drink oh, some of this. Dear God, I made the corner on the steps, and I felt heat, and I saw it. Here. Out of the way! Pull him up. Come out of it. You get out of the way. He can't hear you. Pull it he's, up. he's deaf, too. Who is he? What? Who is he? Oh, that's Eddie. Eddie Rogart. He was a student here before my time. They let him stay on as a kind of handyman. Was he on duty when the fire broke out? That's what I'm trying to tell you. No one was on duty. No one but me. It's Sunday night. I told the others to take the night off, that I would take night duty in the main building. You try to run a place like this on state salaries, try to cut corners to keep your staff happy and give your people a break. Well, there I was in the main building on the ground floor with my books, and I heard this noise. But didn't I tell you all this? Didn't you ask me, and didn't I tell you? Give me another one.
madam, this is not a matter for the attorney general. This is a matter for the police. Now, you heard me, sister. The police said this thing isn't their jurisdiction. They said I should call the attorney general. So you give me the attorney general. The attorney general is away, madam. However, I can give you an assistant attorney general. Well, just hurry. And what do you sister? This is long as the sun can't just stand here shoving its quarters. Yes, madam. What have you done? I'm not a drunk. Who knows? I think she wants to bother somebody. Say, why do we let her bother Shelby? Why not? He's, uh, you know, an eager beaver. Yes, twice this week I worked late, two dinner dates right out the window. We we'll just do? put this complaint right on the line and let him take this big mouth here. Go ahead. Yes? Uh, Mr. Shelby, this is Miss Shelby. There's somebody on the line who wants to speak to a member of our staff. I'm working on brief, Miss Booth. Give oh. it to one of the other men. Well, I'm sorry, sir, but the the board is all lit up. All right, I'll take it. Yes, sir. Hello. Hello, Selby here. Hello? Who am I speaking to? I want the Attorney General. I'm an assistant to the Attorney General. Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I help you? What do you think I'm calling you for, you jerk? From a hundred miles away, from another state, from long distance. You think I'm calling to say good morning to you, you jerk? Madam, I'd be glad to help you if you just tell me what your problem is. I'll tell you all right. Hey, give me my drink over here. I'm drunk, but I'm going to tell you. And what I'm going to tell you is the truth. Can you hear me, you jerk? Huh, can you? Yes, I can certainly hear you. May I drop dead? May I drop dead in this stinking phone booth? In this slimy tavern, if this isn't the truth. Now you, jerk, listen. Hello, I'm listening. I'm li- Madam? Hello. Hello. Last night, back in your state, there was a fire. A fire at a... For kids that don't hear so good. I was there, you jerk. You hear me, huh? You hear me? I was right there with him. That so good. Dirty, rotten creep. Who were you there with? Oh. Rotten. Who do you think, you jerk? Him, Felson. That no good, phony Felson, superintendent, cop, whatever they call him out there. That's who. What are you trying to say? What am I trying? What's the matter, Mr. Big Shot? You think I'm so drunk I can't talk, huh? I ain't trying, you jerk. I'm saying that I was there with him, Belson, right there. And everything he says in the papers about that fire is just one big stinking lie. He wasn't in no main building, like he said. When that fire started, he was down in his cottage with me. What's your name, madam? Hmm. You just never mind my name. Now, you, you just shut up and listen good. He sneaked me into his cottage, see. He said how it was a Sunday night and nobody'd see. Oh, he bragged about that, how how he let everybody have the night off so nobody'd see. So there we were. We were drinking and we were fighting about something because, well, that's the kind of a creep Belson is. He likes to, well, fight and to get a hold of a woman and to sneak her in there and to drink and to fight. Madam, you realize you're making these charges against a man with a good reputation? Now, listen. I am making them. You take it or leave it. I'm making them. We were standing there screaming at each other. And then we saw that fire. Gulfin, he he ran out toward the fire. I got myself fixed up and I went down to the bus stop. Will you give me your name, please? You. Now listen to me, please. If you're not just drunk, if this isn't some oh. stupid barfly joke, you can't just hang up. Do you now, understand? Listen, don't tell me what I can't do, mister. I done everything. Can't you guess that? Only I'll tell you one thing I never did. I never left no kids in a fire like Belson did. Hello. Help. Help. Miss Booth, did you cut me off? Well, no, sir, I didn't. Is something wrong? No. Would you tell Mr. Schuber I'd like to see him right away, please? Uh, yes, sir. Well, here we go. Mr. Schuber, the fun is about to begin. Selby wants to see you. Oh? He just got a phone call from some drunk crank, and you know Selby, our old crusader, and our public defender, he'll want you to check it out and run it down and check it out and run it down. He's not so bad, Miss Booth. Oh, no. You love him just like the rest of us. 
I'm well aware of that, Schuber. She undoubtedly is another one of the drunks and cranks that glom onto a headline and then pester us with calls. I know that as well as you do. Well, I'll check it out. I wish you would. I've got some other things to do first. The parole appeal and the matter down in Sussex County, but then I'll get to it. Schubert. Yes, Mr. I Selby. want you to get on this right away. Well, look, Mr. Selby, I try to do this job as best I can. I handle things as they come along. I'd like this handled now, please. Are you telling me how to do my job? No, I'm simply telling you that the other matters can wait. I want Belson checked out right now. Is that an order, Mr. Selby? If you need an order, that's an order. You got some more orders for me, Mr. Selby? No, no, of course not. I... I didn't mean to shout. It's okay. Look, if you don't mind, Mr. Selby, I'd like to get going. I repeat, I've got an awful lot of assignments on my schedule. I respect the way you do your job, Schuber. I... I... Look, I'd like to explain something to like you about I say, my... Mr. Selby, if you want me to get on the Belson matter first, please let me get going. I'd like to explain something to you about myself. You see, I have special reasons for feeling strongly about kids in state institutions. I know, I know, Mr. Selby. We all know around here you were an orphan, you grew up in state institutions, and you've come a long way on your own. Don't you think people try to figure out why you're the way you are, pushing every little thing to the limit? Now, I'm not saying you don't mean well but you always wind up getting everybody sore at you. For the record, I'd like to finish what I started to say. Okay, I didn't come in here to have you feel sorry for me, Schuber, because I was brought up in state institutions, and because I may have run across a Belson or two, because I'm doing all right now, Schuber, even though Miss Booth out there doesn't approve of me and even though you don't like me. I like my job. I believe in my job. Sure, sure. You've got kids of your own, haven't you, Schuber? Would you like those kids of yours to be under Belson's care if those charges are true? It's a kind of a silly question, isn't it? You just do your job, Schubert. That's all I ask of you. That's all I ask of anybody. Mr. Selby. If I find out anything, I'll let you know. Thank you, Schubert. Quit just me, you know. Mm, something smells good. Hamburgers. Oh. I hurt your feelings this afternoon. No, you didn't, No, no, Schubert. I hurt them. I realized it at the time, but I was sore at you because you pulled rank on me, so I kept on talking. You know something? I'm just a little drunk, but believe it or not, it's partly in the line of duty. You mind if I sit down? No, no, sit down. You know, you start shaking up on a guy like Belson. There's only one way. You get a photograph of his and you drop into the bars in the area and you sit back and wait for somebody to recognize it and start talking. And along the way you have a drink here and a drink there. Did somebody start talking? Some people did, Mr. Selby. Well, go on, Schubert, go on. I think, well, I can't prove it. I probably never could prove it from what I picked up this afternoon. 
But I think that the lady who called you had a pretty good line on Mr. Belt. No, I told you so? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's what I said to myself along the line. I said, there'll be no I told you so. Go on, sir. Well, Go on. It's just what a few people said, you know. A few bartenders, a few dames that hang around the bars. You get a pattern, Mr. Selby. And from one or two things that I picked up from a couple of friends of mine who work out of the police station near the school. Yeah. A pattern. Mr. Belson being seen coming out of the school grounds late at night, funny times. Mr. Belson, very careful to buy his whiskey in little out-of-the-way liquor stores. But buying a lot more than you'd expect the head of a school like that to buy. Mr. Belson, spotted across the state line in Banyan City. You know, where the creeps and the yeah. deadbeats go for a strip show and maybe a little more. Mind if I get myself a glass of water? There's nothing more about Belson? Well, there doesn't have to be, does there? I mean, feeling the way you feel about a school like that... Kids like that, and with the original tip to go on, even though you can't use a, an anonymous tip legally, you're ready to roll, aren't you? Oh, I'm ready to roll. Boy, oh boy, am I ready to roll. Sure. And now I'll tell you another reason why I got a little drunk. Somewhere along the l line, uh, maybe the third or fourth bar, I began to see uh, another pattern forming. And I knew you'd say you were going after Belson in the morning, so I started to heist a few toasts to the success of our investigation. Our investigation? Well, now, I'm a little drunk, but I don't slur that badly, do I? I said it very clear. Our investigation. When did you join the team? I don't know. Sometime today. Well, I'm glad. Sure. Well, it's not going to be easy, huh? Oh, no. It's one thing to order an investigation. It's going to be something else to... Uh, prove the charges against Belson. Well, what'll they be? Uh, criminal negligence? Yes. Yes, I think so. Well, it's not going to be easy. No, it won't be easy. And if you do order the investigation and you can't make the charges stick, it'll probably be your neck. Well, it could be your neck, too, you know. If you become too closely identified with me. What did you say we were having for supper? Hot dogs? Hamburgers. like Phil Selby are really popular. They work very hard at their jobs. They enforce the law. They are what we call do-gooders. They do us good. Naturally, we hate them. That's why I'm glad Phil found a friend in Schubert. We meet them next as they investigate the scene of the fire. noise. It'll drive us all crazy. These incredible charges, Mr. Selby, you, you really intend to use them as a basis for an investigation? That's what we're doing right now, Mr. Belson. And you propose to relieve me of my position during your investigation? Yes, it's customary. Just when I need it here so desperately because of the fire, you'd really do that to these children? Mr. Belson, if those charges are true, and only an investigation can show that, children would be much better off without you. If the charges are true. Ah, oh, the fire was a nightmare, and now I find the nightmare goes on and on. Yesterday afternoon, I was shopping in the town. I ran into Bob Anders, who runs the corner spirit shop. You mean the whiskey store? Yes, Mr. Schubert, the whiskey store. He told me someone had been asking about how much whiskey I might be buying. I suppose that was you. That was me. Well, I wondered at the time why anyone would want to know that. But now I begin to understand. Coupled with the monstrous charges of that insane woman, whoever she was, wouldn't even give her name. It makes a kind of nightmarish sense. <laughs> I suppose you think I drink a lot, Mr. Schuber. You drink plenty. And you spread your business around. That's true. I drink, and I drink in secret, and I'm often ashamed of how much. Aren't you going to ask me why? 
Don't you think a place like this can break your heart? Especially if you're a man who really cares, who wants to help. Don't you think you might need a few drinks at the end of the day? <clears throat> yes, who is it? Come in. Pfeiffer. What's wrong? I came to see Mr. Selby. Well, Pfeiffer, you know how I feel about leaving classes unattended. Mr. Pfeiffer is taking over temporarily, Mr. Belson. Oh, I see. Mr. Belson, I'm sorry. And what am I supposed to do? Just go? Just clear out? It would be better. Well, I guess I'll get a lawyer. That's your right, sir. My right? My right, Mr. Selby. My right is to be here. My duty is to be here. You big shots, you big investigators, waving your official papers. Where were you? Where were you during the years when I was teaching them, when I was protecting them? Yes, and when on more than one occasion I was burying them. <laughs> Pfeiffer. Mr. Pfeiffer, the children, the children in the third class, this was the day they were expecting to go into the city to see the planetarium. Oh, I know, but I'm afraid that now they won't be able to go because of all this. That's, that's right. They'll be tragically disappointed. Let's give them another date, shall we? You know how kids are. It's fine when they have another date to look forward to. Yes. And the charter bus and the, the cafeteria near the planetarium where they were going to eat. You better call them. Oh, yes, I, I will. Yes. He's faking now. He's good at it, but he's a fake. I think so. What do you think, Mr. Pfeiffer? Well, Mr. Selby, I, I just don't know. Uh, except for work, he keeps away from the rest of us, says he believes in that. He would. He, the rest of us have our own rooms and apartments right here in this cluster of main buildings. Only Mr. Belson lives off by himself in that cottage, the one we talked about. Yes, the famous cottage. Would anyone else here at the school have had any reason to be near that cottage on the night of the fire? Nobody that might be likely to help you. Nobody but him. Who? Eddie, the handyman. The one doing the hammering. Where was he? Oh, don't get excited, gentlemen. Eddie's a very special problem. Come on, I... Mr. Pfeiffer, where was he? Well, there's an old tool house just around the bend from the cottage. Out of sight, but quite close, really. Eddie made it into a little house for himself some time ago. Well, maybe he heard something. Oh, you forget, Mr. Selby. Eddie's deaf, too. Maybe he saw something. Well, we've got to try. He may be the last lead we'll get. Well, I'll ask him, but I doubt it. He's a man of a thousand terrors. The night, strangers, dogs. At night, he closes the shutters that he made for himself. He puts out the lights. He just lies there in the dark. Just huddling there, Mr. Selby. Alone and afraid until it's daylight again. You understand? Friends of the school. Friends of the children. You understand? Eddie loves the children very much, gentlemen. Mm. Eddie would do anything for the children. Eddie, I'm talking about the night of the fire. 
You were in your own little house that night, weren't you? Now, Eddie, for the children, for their sake, answer me. That night, did you see anybody go to Mr. Belson's cottage? Eddie, did you? Is it possible that he misunderstood you, that he didn't read your lips right? Oh, he understood, all right. But I'll make sure. Says he didn't see anyone. A little bit earlier, he saw a big dog. I told you he's terrified of dogs. Yes. Oh. Saw the big dog, closed the shutters and locked them. Then you didn't see anything. Till that later. Saw the lights from the fire trucks. Coming through the cracks in the shutters. Then he looked up. And saw the big fire. Hmm? He asked permission to go on with his work. <sighs> yes, all right. May I try, Mr. Pfeiffer? Please. Ed... Eddie, we are friends. Eddie, the reason we are asking these questions is because a woman who might be lying and who might not be lying says that she was with Mr. Belson on the night of the fire in his cottage. She says they were drinking, Eddie. That he was drunk when he was supposed to be watching the children. The children that you love so much. Now, I beg of you, Eddie, try again. Didn't you see anything else? Anything else? Well, that's a great start, isn't it? We've got a witness who could have heard, but he can't hear. And maybe one of the kids was up and around and saw something. Well, I doubt it, Mr. Schuber. Children like this, they're more timid than normal children. Well, let's ask them, shall we? Surely. Night of the fire. Did you see Mr. Belson? No, I didn't see Mr. Belson. Mary, I know you. You like to get up at night and look out the window. No, no, I don't do that. Mary, it's all right. You get ideas for poems. You write very good poems. In poems, I may be anything. I can hear lots of things. I know, Mary dear. But don't make believe now. Tell the truth. Did you get up and see Mr. Belson outside the building? No. Mary, are you, are you sure? I'm sure my eyes are all right. They're beautiful, Mary. Beautiful eyes. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Mary. Well, would you like to see another one? No, no, not this morning. Thank you, Mr. Fiver. I've got a lot of work piled up back at the office. I know Mr. Schubert's got work piled up, too. Oh, it's all right, Mr. Selby. Mr. Selby, you know, as first things 
first days go, this wasn't so bad. No? You lie like he does. Oh. Who else? My friend, Mr. Belson, Mr. Arnold Belson, who felt so badly because the children didn't get to the planetarium today. So, you know, I think maybe I've lost where we are. Mr. Pfeiffer, could you show us to the car, please? Oh, I'll be glad to. Just cut right across the lawn. Doctors say the crying will stop in well, time. Well, the deaf ones are fortunate about one thing. They don't have to hear this. What happened here? Well, one of the fire trucks did that, backing up. I'd say Eddie had enough to keep him busy for a month. <laughs> Five minutes till closing time. You must admit, though, it's been a pretty good week. We'll still be away at the school. I'll say. Uh oh, here they come. The Bobsy twins. Well, we'll try it again tomorrow. Sure, sure, Phil. Well, it's about time. What? Started calling me by my first name. Oh. Oh, Mr. Selby, your message. Thank you, Miss Booth. Phil. What? Well, Elson's been busy. Who's the other one? Attorney Valentine, smart lawyer, big connection. Uh, hello, Phil. Oh, Ernie, how are you? This is Mr. Schubert, this is Mr. Oh. Valentine. Mr. Belson here has engaged me to represent him. So I gather. Give him the paper, Mr. Valentine. Show him he can't get away with this kind of persecution. I intend to, Mr. Belson. Phil, Judge Everest sign this for us. To show cause order on a writ of mandamus. When's it returnable, Ernie? Day after tomorrow. Three o'clock, if that's convenient. What does it mean? Well... It means that I get my job back. That you can't go on hounding me, prying into what I buy and where I buy it and all the rest. What it means is that the day after tomorrow, I have to show cause before Judge Everest why Mr. Belson should not continue in his job. Why the entire investigation shouldn't be dropped. Show cause? Show proof. That's what it means. Proof that you won't get because it never existed and you both knew it all along. Would you like to try the case right here? I'll try the case in lots of places before I'm through, Mr. Selby. In the newspapers, in the offices of people I know, and I know some very important people. I've worked for the state a long time, now, Mr. Selby. yourself, Mr. Belson. We obtained what we came for, and I think we should leave now. I won't forget you, Selby. It's not finished yet. You're finished, Selby. You tried to destroy me in my career. And after tomorrow, so help me, after my hands are untied, I'll see that you're destroyed, too. Are you coming, Mr. Valentine? The district attorney has a copy of that, sir. Oh, yes, sir. Well, he thinks he's in the clear, huh? And if we can't answer that writ on Tuesday, he'll be back at his desk on Wednesday. You can't let him, Phil. And you know why. Sure, he'll keep his nose clean for just a little while, and then he'll do it again. And this time, maybe the kids won't be so lucky. Maybe next time, the kids will get hurt. Some of them have already been hurt. You heard that crying? Why, the metal shock of that fire could scar them for life. I tell you, Phil, that man is guilty. He's a fake. He's a lying, hypocritical fraud. We've got one more day. What do you say we get back out there? I don't know what we're going to do, but let's get back out there. Sure, come on. Attorney General's office. <laughs> Cardinal crime is murder. But there are some crimes that are almost as bad. I'm talking about crimes 
against the helpless and the weak, crimes against children. It's not just enough to punish a fellow like Belson. It's even more important to make sure these children get the right care and protection in the future. Now, with only one day left, our two investigators have a tough job ahead of them. There's nobody left, Daddy. You are the only one left. Do you understand that? Eddie, it's the last day. Do you understand the last day? Now look up at me. Bill, there's no point in shouting. You I can't know. hear a I shout. Know. Sorry, Eddie. Sorry. Eddie, Eddie, look at me. We've talked to all the children again. We've talked to everybody who lives around here. Nobody knows anything. Well, let me try. Eddie, even the bus drivers, the bus drivers who might have picked that woman up after the fire, she said she ran out and caught a bus. Well, we talked to all of them. All they can remember is the fire. Look, son, son, please. Try once more, will you please? Are you sure you didn't go out? Not even once. Eddie, Eddie, after, after you heard the dog and you closed those shutters, then didn't you go out for anything? Eddie, you don't have much of anything in here, not even a bathroom. Are you sure you didn't go out and go to the bathroom? Oh, it's no use, Sal. We can't bother them anymore. We can't bother any of them anymore. Eddie? Eddie? Do you want to go back to work? Work? Go ahead. We're clearing out. Eddie must have seen a dog. A dog? Well, there's no dog out here. Maybe he just ran around the shed. No, 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 no. I was out here all the time. That dog's in back of the shack. Eddie. Eddie, you heard. Eddie? Eddie? You can hear! You don't have to look at my lips, Eddie. You heard that dog when he was nowhere in sight. No. Yes, Eddie, you dropped the toolbox, you heard that dog, and then you dropped your toolbox. <laughs> toolbox just dropped. No. I can't hear. You can hear, Eddie. I you can I hear. I can't hear. Yes, you can. I can't hear. I, I can't hear. Well, I, I made him cry. I beat him down and made him cry. What's the matter with me? I think maybe you proved something, Phil. Well, we can't quit now, Al. Same gentleman, 1945, which was at his last year here as a student, shows the same pattern as the two preceding years. Once again, as in 1944 and 1943, there was none of the development he'd shown as a younger child. The hearing, the social adjustment, the speech, it all stopped advancing. Is it possible that he was faking? Now, oh, please, is it possible that around the time he was 12 years of age, around here, in 42, let's say, when he realized he was going to have to leave the institution in a few years, is it possible that at that time he started to seem more deaf and less socially adjusted than he really was? I know that's what you want to hear. No, no, no. Mr. Could he have, Mr. Pfeiffer? Just could he have? Now think of it, gentlemen. Here is a poor, frightened boy. A boy with a barely adequate IQ, but he has a million frights and fears. Now is it possible for that boy to fool the entire staff for three years' time? 
Hardly seems likely, Mr. Selby. It's clear from the records that he was never much of a prospect at best. Someone like that, a marginal case, it could go either way. But as for fooling the entire staff, well, as you yourself mentioned, he does have a rather low IQ. Yes, but now wait a minute. Isn't it possible that he was smart enough to realize that he was going to have to leave the school in a few years' time? Terrified? As a matter of fact, terrified enough to get himself a job like he's got right now, that of handyman. Isn't that possible? Yes, it's possible. And isn't this the kind of job, Mr. Pfeiffer, that would only go to someone who was deaf? So deaf that they couldn't be forced into the outside world. That's right. You know, that's right. And you really think Eddie heard that dog bark? I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. And if he could have heard the dog barking, he could have heard the drunken argument that went on in Belson's cottage the night of the fire. If it really went on. It went on, Mr. Pfeiffer. And Eddie heard it. And loving kids the way he does must break his heart not to be able to put the finger on Belson. But if what you're suggesting is the truth, then what? We get the truth out of Eddie. What else? But how, Phil? We're not going to have access to these files tomorrow. We're not going to have the run of the office like right now. It's ironic, isn't it? Here I am trying to think and do what Nettie would want done in his heart, but I can't think because of his damn noise. Oh, it's still the clean-up from the fire. I wish he'd clean up somewhere else, that's huh. all. That's his own way of doing things. Of course, I could order him to be more scientific about it, but I'd hate to do that. And yet it all seems so senseless. He ignores the little things and goes after the biggest. Well, the biggest mess is right here. Oh, no, Mr. Schubert. From the standpoint of clean-up, the biggest mess is that broken wall down at the infirmary. It's one less day, Al. Huh? What did you just say, Mr. Pfeiffer? The biggest mess is where? The infirmary? Wall? That's where those children are, isn't it? The ones who are crying, frightened by the fire. Oh, yes, that's right. I want you to order Eddie to go down and start fixing that wall right now. What? I think Eddie's been avoiding it. I don't think he can bear to hear those children cry. Mr. Selby, that would be cruel. No, Mr. Pfeiffer. To have Belson continue on here, that would be cruel. Don't you see what Phil is driving at, Mr. Pfeiffer? You mean if Eddie can hear, this might break him down? Yeah. Exactly. Come on. Has it been now? Three o'clock. Maybe you're there home. almost two and a half hours now. I'm Aren't not wrong, wrong, Mr. Pfeiffer. He'll break down. You just wait and see. I tell you one thing, I know. I know kids. I've got five of them. When kids are sick, they get crankiest around four o'clock in the afternoon. Those kids are going to get louder. I don't know about Eddie. I can't stand this much longer. We're doing all we can for those children, Mr. Selby. Say, Mr. Pfeiffer, is it permissible for those children to have ice cream and cake? Not only permissible, desirable. Well, I think Mr. Schuber and I are going to send some around starting tomorrow. Thank you. Listen to no, me no, now. Don't, don't do that. Eddie, I know you can hear me. I know you can hear me, Eddie, and if you'll talk now, I swear to you that a man like Belson, a dirty, hypocritical, lying fraud like Belson, will go to jail. I swear it to you, Eddie, because I'll prosecute the case myself. And Eddie, I give you my solemn oath that I will find a place for you if they can't keep you on here. Do you understand? I'll find a place for you, Eddie, near children, where you can work and be happy. As a man, as a kind, gentle man, Eddie, who loves children and doesn't want to see them suffer. Eddie, 
as a man, I promise you. I know you hear me, and I know you hear those children. Now, for the love of God, stand up and say you hear. Say you always heard. Eddie. Not on your knees. Up. Stand up. Like a man. I heard that woman. I... I heard... I... I heard... I... I... I heard... I... Eddie. Eddie, Eddie. It's gonna be all right. It's gonna be all right. Loretta Young Show, next over most of these NBC stations.